to take some time today to talk a little bit about the current pandemic in terms of health security. In this presentation, I'm going to give you three ways to think about global public health uh, in the responsibilities of individuals and states in the preservation of global public health. So what do we mean by global public health? Well, it's been defined as the activities required to minimize the danger and the impact of acute public health events that endanger the collective health of pop populations living across geographic regions and international boundaries. So what we're going to be talking about today is the ways in which public health is a collective good. It is something that, as we have seen traditionally, one individual can only do so much. Sure, you can wash your, wash your hands. Sure, you can use Lysol wipes and all the rest. But what we see is health is a good that basically your city has to work to preserve. Everyone in your city needs to work together. Everyone in your country needs to work together. If there's an outbreak, uh, that's not because of the actions of any one individual. It's because of our collective actions. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Global public health has a lot to do with interdependence, and it has a lot to do with cooperation. I'm going to give you three ways to think about global public health today. Uh, the first one is this idea of a collective action problem, a problem that can only be solved by a group of people cooperating together. And we're going to talk a little bit about how individual actions can either contribute to or undermine a collective action problem. The second way I'm going to give you to think about global public health has to do with what we refer to as an ethic of care. We're going to talk a little bit about the carer and the cared for and the responsibilities of the carer, thinking about us in society who are currently healthy as carers rather than the cared for. And the final way I'm going to give you to think about global public health and your responsibilities and rights as a citizen uh, in attacking this global public health problem is Rawlsian justice ethics. And here we're going to ask a little bit about what is a just solution when we have conflicts between how individuals want to behave and what's best for the individual and what's best for society. Should society tell you you have to stay home? Should society tell you that you cannot travel, that you cannot go to the beach? Uh, and so these are very relevant topics, but I don't know that we've given you a framework before for thinking through some of the issues raised in these conflicts that we are seeing in our society today revolving around the issue of global public health. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay. So a collective action problem, I've got some pictures here that I think illustrate this probably better than anything. Uh, well, you have two here. We have an empty toilet paper roll and we have some empty shelves in a, presumably a supermarket. And often you've seen these empty shelves, particularly in the paper products section. Uh, well, a collective action problem is defined as a situation in which all individuals would be better off cooperating but they fail to do so because of conflicting interests between individuals that discourage collective action. So just think for a minute here, maybe you wake up real early one morning and you go to the supermarket and they're restocking the shelves and your individual impetus might be to buy all of something, right? Oh, look, they're putting milk in the uh, dairy case. I'm going to buy five gallons. I'm going to take it home. I'm going to freeze it, right? Oh, maybe my mom needs some. Maybe I'll buy six. Uh, but we hear people on TV talking about the supermarket supply chain and they're saying in order for our supply chain to get back to normal, we need to not Hoard. We need to buy just enough for us so that the system will work for everyone. So the best solution for the collective is for everyone to buy just enough food, but the best individual impulse might still be to say, I got mine tough tough on you, you should have woken up earlier, right? And so that's why we have these empty shelves, is we have a failure to act collectively in the best interest. We have some people who are kind of violating that collective rule that says take just enough for you and your family. Uh, they're taking more than their share, you might say. And that's the problem with a lot of collective goods in the international system. Uh, we have some people who are taking 
more than their share, they're overfishing. And as a result, the fish population might be suffering in a lake or it might be suffering in the ocean. Uh, Japan, for example, has been accused of overfishing. Uh, and the idea is that keeping that balance of enough fish in the lakes and the ponds and the oceans is something that all the countries need to work collectively to uh, kind of rein in those impulses. We also encounter collective action problems when we think about something like, uh, you know, polluting a lake or a river. Uh, it might be in your individual best interest to get rid of your waste that way. It's the cheapest way to do it, uh, but it's not in the group's in, uh, collective interest for people to pollute a river because everyone suffers as a result. Uh, lots of times when we talk about things like, you know, the ozone layer and climate change and those uh, ice caps, polar ice caps that are melting, again, here's a collective action problem. Every nation would have to rein in its air polluting uh, uh, carbon depletion activities in order for the polar ice caps to recover and the uh, overall air climate for the whole world as a whole to be better. Again, there's an individual impetus to want to pollute, but uh, the best thing for sort of society is if everyone uh, reigns in that impulse and acts collectively. Uh, analysts who've talked about this, there's a philosopher named Russell Harden, and he talks about something called the tragedy of the commons. He says, imagine if you will, back in sort of the Revolutionary War days, uh, Boston Commons in uh, the city of Boston. It was actually uh, an agricultural field. And the people who lived around that commons would all graze their animals collectively in this collective field. And the problem is that if one individual decided that he didn't just want to raise enough cows for his family, but he wanted to go into some form of mass agricultural production. So instead of grazing six cattle for his family on that commons, he decided to graze 30. What would happen would be overgrazing, and as a result, uh, no one would be able to graze their animals there and feed their family. So again, uh, the idea is that the resources, the commons are shared, and the tragedy is that we all have this individual impulse to want to take more than our share, uh, which undermines kind of the collective goal. So what does that have to do with what's going on today? Well, we might think of global public health as being similar to that Boston Commons. And the idea is that none of us should kind of take too many risks with our health. We should practice social distancing like the fellows in that photo on the top, six feet apart, uh, and not like these people on the bottom who went ahead and went to the beach. And if you recall sort of some of these uh, interviews of these folks who went to the beach over spring break, they basically said, well, I'm not in a risk group. I'm not going to suffer if I travel and I don't practice social distancing. And people said to them, yes, but you can be a vector for disease. Even if you yourself are not in a risk group, you could carry that disease to someone else. You could pollute the commons, the health commons, by introducing disease into that health commons, and then others will suffer as a result. The sanctity of that health commons will be violated because germs are being introduced into it. Uh, so again, there's this individual, uh, and if you recall some of those students, they said, well, I already paid for my trip. You're telling me I have to lose out of the money that I saved and I worked for and I paid for my trip so that someone else won't suffer. I'm really just interested in recouping my individual investment. So that's the tragedy of the commons way of thinking about health behavior on an individual and a group level. Uh, and another wonderful example when we think about the tragedy of the commons is a wonderful novel by a woman named Geraldine Brooks. She wrote it in 2001, and it's called Year of Wonders. And in this novel, she describes something that took place in England between 1665 and 1666 when the plague had yet another outbreak. Uh, and in this case, it, this whole novel takes place in a real village, and it's re based on real events uh, in a town called Ayam. It's in Derbyshire in England, near Yorkshire. And what happened was uh, 
plague was introduced into this village. Uh, there was a tailor. He came from London, uh, and it turned out that the cloth he had made to sell to the uh, villagers uh, had fleas on it who carried the plague, uh, and people in this town began dying, and their initial instinct was to leave, just like now people have the instinct to leave New York City uh, or to leave New Orleans. Uh, and he knew that if, uh, and it's, it's kind of one of the characters is that he's a a uh, rector, a pastor in this town, uh, Thomas Montpelier, and he also is a real person. And he said, I know your uh, individual instinct is to leave, but if you leave, you're going to carry this plague elsewhere in England, and you're going to threaten other people's villages and other people's lives. And so he prevailed upon the villagers to stay in the village and kind of quarantine themselves. He set out a cordon so that they couldn't go to other villages and people from other villages wouldn't come to them. Uh, and a great many people in this village died, but in this act of sort of uh, self-sacrifice, they basically preserved the health of many other people in this region. Uh, so that's uh, the first way of thinking about uh, health security is a tragedy of the commons. Let's move on to the second one. The second way uh, that we can think about uh, health security uh, is using a philosophical lens called the ethic of care. And this comes out of kind of feminist philosophy and many of the people who write about the ethic of care, they say that we as humans have an instinct to be relational and to take care of others. We have something that's really only uh, sort of unique to humans called empathy. Uh, if you're a mom, you can tell if your baby's hungry. You can tell if your baby just wants a cuddle. Uh, and they say that carers have this ability to empathize with those who require care, whether because they are very young or because they are very old or because they are sick. Uh, and they claim that this works both on a sort of an individual and a national level. Uh, and so people who talk about an ethic of care, they suggest that uh, People engage in caregiving really for two reasons. One is because they have this instinct to respond to the needs of the cared for. And the second is that they do, to some degree, reap some benefits from it. They like to be perceived by others as being caring individuals. Nations like to be perceived as acting in moral, benevolent ways. Uh, and so this is where we get these ideas then of like, you know, virtue signaling, the idea that people are engaging in activities so that someone can make a video of them doing so and uh, kind of playing it on the internet. And we see this now in conversations about whether or not Elon Musk was really acting generously and offering to give ventilators or, you know, was he more interested in how he would be perceived, something like that. Um, so this is the second way then is to think about the ethic of care, the idea that the non-vulnerable person uh, population, in this case healthy people, should afford extra consideration to the vulnerable communities while making decisions that might affect him. And we have this word up here, triage. We've heard a lot about this lately. The idea that there aren't actually enough ventilators for everyone in society. Uh, and as a result, uh, Hospitals may have to come up with use regimes. They may have to come up with rules for who is going to get those ventilators if there are more sick people than there are uh, equipment for them. And some states have, uh, and some insurance companies have leaked information in some hospitals suggesting that uh, perhaps people over a certain age shouldn't be allowed to have access to that technology if there are younger people who need it. Uh, in one state, there were rules that said if you were disabled, if you had cancer, if you had autism, if you had uh, Down syndrome, perhaps you should not have access to that equipment. And so here what we see is people being concerned about how they are perceived. If you are a governor or a mayor and people think that basically you're practicing eugenics, you're saying only the fittest should survive, something like that, uh, you're not likely to win re-election, right? Uh, you're not going to be perceived very well in a government that's engaged in mass triage of uh, uh, where people are being denied these benefits, people who maybe are elderly or uh, disabled, uh, it may affect how people think about that government. It may affect about uh, how they are willing to basically uh, 
follow the rules uh, if they don't regard the government as legitimate, if they regard the government as inhumane. And so care ethics uh, suggests that, yes, we are relational. Yes, we have a uh, responsibility to those who are weaker in the communities, but they also suggest that uh, people notice how they're being perceived, states and individuals. Uh, are they being perceived as acting generously? Uh, and then the final uh, model that I can give you to think about uh, uh, decisions that people make about healthcare ethics is this idea of justice. And if you see this picture here, you can see that kind of lady justice, she's blind, right? The idea is that if she's going to decide what's fair in a situation where something is being rationed, like healthcare, people are being asked to change their behavior due to health security, uh, it may be important to consider who you are in that equation and what your interests are and what it would look like if you, uh, if justice was truly blind. So here, uh, when we think about justice being blind, uh, we uh, refer to the work of the philosopher John Rawls, and he talks about something called the veil of ignorance. He says, if you were going to make a decision about how to distribute something fairly, you would think about that differently maybe if you were the landlord versus if you were the tenant. You would think about it differently if you were the slave holder versus if you were the slave himself or herself. And he says to really and truly come to the most just and equitable solution, you would have to pretend that you didn't know who you were in that equation. And then you would have to think about, well, who is the weakest person in that equation? Who is the person who is most likely to be harmed by an unjust solution to that problem? So if we go back to those young students on the beach in Florida, a Rawlsian uh, justice ethic would say, everybody has to pretend that they are actually a 95-year-old lady with a pre-existing condition. And if you were not the young beachgoer, but you were the 95-year-old lady with a pre-existing condition who was most likely to be harmed by this pandemic, what would she then ask of you? What would she then want? What would be the most equitable solution for her? And of course, the most equitable solution would be for everyone to stay home, for everyone to practice social distancing. Uh, and we can tie this into integration of faith, can't we? In a sense, if you say pretend behind a veil of ignorance that you do not know who you are and you take the position of the weakest person in that equation, it's very similar to what we read about in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 40. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters, you did for me. So the way to kind of get in the most equitable and just solution in terms of how our rights might be uh, curtailed during this time in order to produce health as a collective good would be to take the position of the least of these within our society. Uh, so these are sort of the three ways you to think about health security, and I hope that what I've shown you through the example of the village of Am in England and so forth is that health security problems are not new. They're very old, aren't they? Uh, and I hope that as I've shown through the uh, tragedy of the commons, the example of the supermarket, uh, health security problems are also not novel. Uh, states have often dealt with these questions of how do we preserve a collective good and what is the appropriate individual response in a collective situation security situation. Uh, so uh, all these old themes are once again relevant, and I hope this presentation has been useful to you this morning.